And can I ask you just to steady that? It's there, and if you would, I think we'll just move this out of the way so that you can see. So, there's our uterus. The baby and the placenta are out, and now we need to sew. So, we're going to open the sutures. Um, when I go, I take expired sutures. Like, in other words, you know, they've got a, a date on them that's just like your yogurt or your milk mm -hmm. at home, mm -hmm. you know, used mm -hmm. by such and such a date. So the nurses save them for me. And also, um, sometimes they've been opened. And in most uh, North American hospitals, there's two wrappers around all of these. And so once the outside one's gone, um, it, it isn't it considered sterile anymore, so uh, this wouldn't be used. Right. So it may still be, it's still good, because it's good yeah. but, uh, till uh, December of 2014, but because the outer wrapper's gone, it can't be used clinically. Right. So the same thing, the nurses save all those. Mm -hmm. These ones actually came from the Ottawa Hospital from the workshop last week, so. Um, and another thing that we practice with the students is, is good um, needle management. So I'll give you a demonstration here. I'm I'm holding the needle with my fingers. We try not to use the fingers very much. But we show them where to put the needle driver on the, where to put the needle on the, this is a driver or a holder, a needle holder. You don't want to put it too close to the end because it'll fall off, mm -hmm. right? But you don't want to put it right in there because it's going to get in the way mm -hmm. of when you're actually sewing. So there's a point at which, so it's close to the end, but not at the very end. And the other thing that is, wh where do you grab the needle with your needle driver? Well, you don't want to put it right there because one thing is that this is uh, round here and it'll roll a lot more. But also, mm -hmm. if you put it there, the best way the needle needs to go in is perpendicular to the tissue. So in order for it to, to get that needle, is you'd have to go like this, right? Mm -hmm. Which isn't really very good technique, yeah. you know. So you want to find the, the solution. On the other hand, it would go in nice and easily if you were close to there, but you're not going to get very much tissue oh, right. between there and there. Right. So the ideal point is somewhere between, say, three quarters and a quarter or two thirds and a third people stress different things. It also depends on the kind of needle that you have. So right about there. When you're not sewing with the needle, and you, you need to put it back and protect the point, oh. Oh. So, which is really important for every surgeon, but I mean, especially if you're working in an area where, where there are more blood-borne diseases, like, like HIV, for yeah. instance, in Africa, right? So we want to make sure, you know, just needle protection like that, like if it becomes a habit, mm -hmm. it could save the nurse's life when you're mm -hmm. passing off and she gets accidentally poked, mm -hmm. or your assistant's life, or your own too, right? So we always try to emphasize that. So then you're ready to use it. We, we um, what I do with my forceps? There they are. So, it's actually the same thing, you know, when we were talking about the cervical laceration. You want to get just past the corner a bit. You don't want to do it um, too far out, like you don't want to do it here. And there's a good example. This is, this is why it's good to have a model, because if the, if the learner puts a stitch in here, where it wouldn't be a good place to be in, it's not close enough to the corner, right? You can just say, mm, take it out and start again. You can't do that with a person <laughs> because there's a hole every place that you've put the needle, right? So it, it, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to really improve technique. So we're just going to get closer to the end so we make sure that that end is well protected. I'd say maybe even a little bit more like there. So that, okay, it's through. I'm going to turn it mm -hmm. before I tie my knot. So there, there are different Mm, the knot practicing session, or the knot tying session that we do, we practice tying knots with two hands. Anybody do brownies or girl guides? <laughs> like, yeah. you know how to tie a reef knot or sail? <laughs> like, a reef knot is, that's what a surgeon's knot oh, is. Okay. It's a reef knot. So, you can't do that because you don't have two ends here. This is attached to the needle, right? So, you learn how to tie a knot with one hand. So, I'll give you the demo. Okay. <laughs> it's that way. That way, oh. that way, and that way, and that way, that way. Hmm. Is that how many knots you would? Usually, it depends on the kind of suture. Usually, a braided suture like this, 
Uh, you can get away with two complete knots. Sometimes people even just do like one and a half complete knots. But if it's a, if it's a monofilament, like a single, mm -hmm. they're very um, sh slippery. Mm -hmm. And you need three complete knots on those, okay. at least. And sometimes people will even do more. But that would be a complete knot is the back and then the fourth. Okay. Okay. Right, so a complete knot is like there's a half and there's the whole knot. Oh, okay. right? Um, and these are dissolvable? Yes, these are dissolvable sutures. So then I need the sutures. Do one in slow motion? Do one in slow motion? Yeah. Sure. Awesome. I'll do a knot in, okay, well, we'll just set it up. And so I'm going to do a knot, in, and actually we do practice the knots in slow motion because you have to sh show somebody how to do it. We have little manuals, too, with pictures. Um, but uh, we practice the, ha let's move a little bit into the light there. We practice by doing a half a knot. And sometimes, I'm going to change my hands because this knot isn't going to work out now because you don't do the same one over and over again. Mm -hmm. But we have them practice that over and over again because maybe that's the part they have trouble with. And then practice the other one. And you'll notice that your hand changes position mm -hmm. so that you're, you, you make the knot this way and then you go back this way. Oh, okay. um, and you know, for a surgeon, it's such a habit. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that I'm tying with my left hand, but I'm a right-handed surgeon. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons it, it, is that you can sew and keep the instrument in your hand and still tie the knot at the same time, right? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, and another uh, um, instrument, another knot that we practice is, an, is what's called an instrument tie. And so I can give you a demonstration of that. You use that in certain circumstances. Um, you make the loop and you pull it through. Okay. And make the loop and pull it through. When we practice with the knot tyings, we use shoelaces hmm. because it, they're really big. Right. So I take up, you know, like two dozen shoelaces or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you can really see the knot because, you know, you'd have to really look carefully to see was that a granny knot or was that really a good, like, surgeon's knot, a good, a good reef knot. Um, so once again, that's the way that you do the instrument tie. And they're actually pretty good, usually, the African students with an instrument tie because you can get more out of your suture if you do an instrument tie. You don't waste as much. Uh -huh. okay. um, so they're, they're often taught that first right. before anything else. But if you understand, we, we start with a, like a two-handed knot and, and make sure they do that one, then the one-handed knot, and then this one, last of all. So we cut that off. And now it's the job of the person who's the assistant to hold the, hold the suture up. So and I would be sterile. <laughs> yes, you'd be, you'd be all. And, you know, that's, that's an exercise that in one of the courses we practice is is getting this, the, gown, the gowns and the gloves on properly. You know, I've done the same thing. I put down my forceps, oh, and where did I put them? Oh, thank you. Yeah. And now we, we sew, and it's, um, we discuss, so making sure that you put the point in straight and using the instrument, using your hand, making sure that you're, you're going all the way through, that you're not trying to force it through like this. Mm -hmm. You're using your hand to, uh, to guide and using the curve of the needle. And then we usually lock. That's not meant to go in there. But I guess it will have to because <laughs> we've got such a big long knot on it. Okay, and so that's one of the things that you okay. learn to do when you're the assistant is drop the suture when the guy needs it dropped and lift it when he needs it lifted up. So. Just go through there. Now, sometimes people wouldn't lock in this layer, and that's one of the things that we'd talk about in the, in the, in the like the kind of the discussion part of the course. What the proper technique is: should you do it this way? Should you do it the other way? The other way is this way that you lock. It's like what you'd call a blanket stitch if you do any, mm -hmm. any stitching it. Well, I guess you guys do do stitching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. You're the professional stitchers. Oops. 
And in real life, this needs to be pretty snug. You can't do it too, uh, too much on the, on the model because it gets all like completely scrunched right. up, you know, right. so. This is the stitch I do on my quilt bindings. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so we, we've, we've finished the, we're just imagining this is inside. We finished the layer, sewed that part of the uterus closed, and usually the bladder is just replaced. Some, sometimes it's stitched, but not usually. Usually it's just replaced and it'll, it'll find its own spot back again. But you just make sure that it's fine, make sure that there's no bleeding, and then we'd start sewing the abdominal wall. So we'll go back to where we were there. So. There are all those layers that we went through, but not all of them need to be closed. So generally, um, the layer of the peritoneum isn't closed mm -hmm. on a cesarean. Uh, but you need the same thing. You need to look and make sure there's no bleeding anywhere. And generally, the muscles wouldn't be sewn because we didn't do anything to the muscles, mm -hmm. right? But the important layer is this layer, this one that's the canvas layer, the sheath, okay? So we want to start, we want to start over in the corner. So I'm going to ask you to demonstrate for me. So which layers should be closed? Uh, again, it's one of the things that we uh, go through in the discussion of uh, the technique of cesarean mm -hmm. section. We actually have a video um, that's made by the World Health Organization uh, talking about what's been shown in randomized control trials, what's the best way we should do it this way. And some of the things that it mentions in the trial are actually not common practice, but they're hoping to, that they will become more common practice with them publishing this video. And it's available on the web. Um, I have a, a CD, so you could actually watch it. You might enjoy that. You just Google um, World Health Organization until you get to that site, and there's a, their little search window. If you put cesarean section video, and I think you have to spell it the English way, oh, like with the AE yeah. way uh, rather than the American right. way, it'll go right. It has a list. It's, I think it's called the Reproductive Health video library or something, and it, you'll just go on the list. It's about 11 minutes long. Oh, okay. I think you'd really enjoy yeah. watching it. Yeah, yeah. that sounds neat. Yeah. <laughs> so you start over in the corner. It's the same thing. You, you, you get, you want to be, you got your needle on the right spot. You make sure that they haven't done this and that they haven't done this. Oops. Did that again? You make sure that the needle's on in the right spot, that it's not too far into the jaws, etc. So. And you start over in the corner. Now, I'm going to tie a knot. I'm going to protect my needle. If I had better technique, a little easier um, forcep, I could just use my forcep and avoid myself poking myself with the needle, right? So now we're ready for that one-handed tie. You can do it now, right? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to see it one more time. Yeah, you, yeah, you need to practice it too. <laughs> um, that's one thing that I found, you know, I used to tie a knot the way that like my grandmother taught me. I find it really hard to tie a knot. Any, like even if I'm sewing something, I tie the knot this way because it's such a strong habit by now. So we're going to do the one handed time. I'm going to do it slowly for you though, okay? This way. And then this way. Sometimes on the first throw, people will do two if, mm. it, if it needs a little extra, okay. uh, like tension. That's a slightly different technique. But again, that's one of the things that you talk about in the knot tying. So that's two complete knots. And again, often the, the, the assistant's the one who cuts the, cuts the suture for you. So now you need three hands. Why don't you just use this one? And I'm going to sew all the way along. So I need to see this side a little better. So that's good. Once you've got started, it's a little easier to see. So it's the same. Put on the other side. 